Good morning. Uh, welcome to this session on introduction to scripting your WebGIS with the ArcGIS API for Python. Uh, my name is Rohit Singh. I'm the lead developer on this project. And joining me is Atma Mani. Uh, he's the lead product engineer. We will have a repeat of this session tomorrow at 10.15 in, in the Hilton Sapphire Ballroom, M slash N. So uh, I, I know the room is full, so if, if somebody wants you know, to change his mind, you can do that. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, what is the ArcGIS API for Python? Uh, it, this is the, the Python API to your WebGIS. Uh, you might be familiar with ArcPy, which has been the Python API to your desktop GIS. So uh, this is the Python API to your ArcGIS Enterprise or ArcGIS Online, online organization. It's a powerful, modern, and easy to use uh, API. What do I mean by that? It's powerful, it has all the analytical capabilities of the web GIS platform. It lets you do things like geo-processing, geo-coding, network uh, routing and directions. In, in ArcGIS Enterprise, it lets you do raster analysis using image server, uh, big data analysis using the geo-analytics server. You've got the ArcGIS Online Spatial Analysis tool. Uh, so all of the analytical capabilities are there. It uh, lets you manage your GIS, uh, content management, user management, things like that. It's a new API. It's, uh, it's something we just released this year. And just last week, we released an update to this API, the first update to this API. It works really well with Conda uh, and Pandas and contemporary Python libraries. It uh, works very well with Jupyter Notebook, for which we've built extra integrations. And we've worked very hard to make it easy for you to use. So it's, uh, it tries to follow a Pythonic uh, pattern, you know, simplest, beautiful Pythonic idioms, all of that. And just so you know, it's, um, it's as an implementation detail, it's implemented using the REST protocol. So it's talking to ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Server through the REST interfaces primarily. And we are adding more local capabilities to it. So if you've got your own local data, shape files or file geo databases, you want to read it, you can work with that, you can publish that, or you uh, suck in data through pandas from so many different formats, you can write it out to these geospatial formats, publish it to your WebGIS. So we are adding more local capabilities where it makes sense, that's the direction we'll go in. But uh, talking about the implementation details, you don't need to know anything about REST or how it works. To you, it's just a local, it's like any other Python module that you're using. So you, you don't need to uh, you know, know that it's under the hood, it's talking to your web GIS. It's, it represents your GIS, you use it like that. Who is it for and what can it do for you? Uh, we've built it for different personas and you'd find that even in our samples, we've divided it by those personas. So on, on the left, you've, you've got administrators and DevOps people who want to uh, manage the users, groups, and content in your web GIS. Uh, you want, want to manage roles, maybe you want to uh, clone portals uh, from you know from uh, staging to uh, production environment, you can do all of that. On the right, you've got content publishers, so that includes publishing the different kind of layers and services that we've got, the the dif different packages, style packages, scene packages. You can publish all of those. You want to publish feature data, as feature services. You want to keep your feature services updated in sync, you want to do uh, replication and sync workflows, you can do that. You want to keep your content up to date, so as uh, some, some data changes, you want to update your web map with newer layers, you can do all of that. And it's also for analysts, so all of the analytical capabilities of the platform are available through a very simple uh, Python interface. And if you are a data scientist, and the distinction between an analyst and data scientist, I think, is it's somewhat gray. It's, I believe, it's a spectrum that starts from analysts and then goes to people who are like hardcore programmers. They are interfacing with 
other machine learning libraries. It goes till that end of the spectrum. And uh, you, you've got the big data analytics, the raster analytics for that. And then this other category, which is very dear to me, is that of a power user and of a developer. And what I mean by power user is that you might not have ever scripted before. You are a web GIS user, and uh, you know the ins and outs of WebGIS, of ArcGIS. Because Python is such a simple language, it, it could be your first language to learn. And you, we don't, you don't need to know advanced concepts in Python. It's a very simple API. This could be your first uh, foray into scripting your WebGIS. And conversely, if you're a developer who doesn't know a whole lot about GIS, this could be your introduction to a GIS. This is what a GIS is. You bring that in. So by a quick show of hands, can we uh, you know, see like how many of you would fall in like an administrator or a DevOps kind of scenario? OK. A fair number. Uh, content publishers and content managers. OK. Great. Analysts and data scientists. Good. So we've got a good mix. And how about power users? and uh, developers, okay. So that's great to know that you know we've got everybody represented in this room. <laughs> Did anyone raise your hands for all? <laughs> <laughs> One man shots. <laughs> and who are the people who didn't raise their hands at all? <laughs> okay. So uh, we'll start off with a quick demo. Uh, and I'll be using Jupyter Notebook for that. Uh, Jupyter Notebook is this, um, this tool that when you install the Python API, it comes as one of the dependencies of the Python API. So you get it, uh, yeah. This is where I started Jupyter Notebook from. Your screen, oh, screen went off. Sorry. Unhook and hook it up again. Okay, so when you install the ArcGIS API for Python, as a dependency, uh, Conda pulls in Jupyter Notebook as well. All you need to do is go to your command prompt, and wherever you want to run your notebook from, change directory into that, and start Jupyter Notebook. And when you do that, uh, it'll open up a browser with this kind of a window, and you can create a new notebook. This is, a, it's like a browser-based IDE, but it's not really an IDE. Uh, it's not a, you know, integrated development environment. It's, it's really a tool which uh, lets you write these notebooks that contain both um, your, your narrative, what your analysis is about, or what you're doing, and also the, uh, the program, the, the code and also the results of your analysis or what, what you achieve. So I tried creating a new Python notebook. It didn't show up. Well, I've got a notebook running. Let me try here. <laughs> I hope it continues running. So you know, you can type in uh, Python code, and, and it should show the results if <coughs> it was working correctly. Let me restart it. That gives us a, OK, it did eventually run. Well, it's good in a way because now we can see Jupyter Notebook starting from scratch. And uh, so that that all that is okay. It uh, should just start up. So I get a new tree view, and now my notebook started up. I can give it a name. And uh, you could you could type in Python code, uh, you know. And you'd get the results interactively. And to use the API, you'd start off by importing it. And it's in the ArcGIS module. And we've got different sub-modules. And you always start with your, with your GIS module, which contains the GIS class. So uh, yesterday in the plenary demo, I, I imported it differently. I said from ArcGIS import star. Well, that's good if you're starting off, but as a good practice, you don't want to bring everything in. 
simply you start simply and you always start by connecting to your GIS now this GIS object the constructor lets me pass in a URL and my login credentials if you don't give in a URL you are connecting to ArcGIS online that's the default GIS and if you don't give in your login credentials you're connecting as an anonymous user so I've already connected to ArcGIS online as an anonymous anonymous user and the constructor uh, it lets you work with all authentication schemes that are supported by the web GIS not just named users like I showed it also works with uh, LDAP or integrated Windows authentication or single sign-on so everything is supported through that constructor and the API you get IntelliSense it reveals itself you, the GIS object lets you manage your content, web maps or web layers, groups and users for collaborating, collaboration, and you can bring in a map. You can give, bring in a map by giving it a location which gets geocoded, or you could give it a lat long. Uh, it works, you know, it takes in different ways and now I'm querying the variable so I, I created the map put it in the M variable and I'm querying it it's like saying you know X equals 2 and then you query it in Python so it's, it's the same way in, in this case my M variable is, is this map so I got a live map of, of Zurich now I want to search my GIS for content and we have a similar pattern whether it's content or users or groups it's always GIS dot that thing dot search or you know get and I can pass in my search terms and I am getting my items and for each item in items let's display display that now this display variable is actually uh, let me import that for clarity it's another thing from IPython that you get so if, if you're trying it yourself you it might not have been imported this is what you should do if, if it doesn't show up and it gives you an error. So I'm calling the IPython's display method displaying the item. And I get back map, image layers, desktop application templates, all the different kinds of here is a geoprocessing sample. So this is giving all the different types of items that you find in like my content and ArcGIS Online. You can filter that by giving a second parameter so here I'll say I only want feature layers and you rerun that cell uh, and I'll only get back the feature layers so let's take the first item that talks about a war in Zurich in 1799 I was told and assign it to that variable that's in the first variable and I could say map dot add layer and give it that item now that item let's look at that item sorry looking at its type we see that it's a feature layer collection it's backed by a feature service and contains multiple layers so a feature service can have multiple layers we see that they are streaming in and, and being drawn on the map the map widget is quite capable it's the same technology that's used to drive the ArcGIS online map viewer it's the same uh, it's under, under the hood it's using the JavaScript API so uh, this item that I got it's it's a feature layer collection I can query the layers that are within it and we see that this item actually has so many like 60 layers backing it that we're drawing so that was just a quick tour of getting started uh, using the API I think next uh, we'll switch over to Atma and he's going to talk about uh, what all it can do for you thanks for it so that was a quick start demo to Python API, what it can do, the kind of overview. 
for the rest of this, uh, rest of the one hour we have, we are going to walk through three scenario style demos. We're going to talk, look at how automators can you make use of it, how publishers can make use of the Python API, and how analysts and scientists can make use of. So starting with GIS automation, GIS administrators. You know, these are some of the things that the administrators can do. Um, instead of, uh, so GIS administrators have to uh, multitask, they have to jump between tasks and do a lot of things keep, to keep the shop running. They have to populate, if, if, they, if you create a new RGS enterprise, they have to bring the users and groups into that so people can start using it. Um, and if you have multiple uh, RGS enterprises or portals, then one behind, one in your staging area, development area, one the customer facing area, you got to clone the items from one to another, maybe like a, um, like a QA area to a production area. And if you want to reassign content when a user leaves the organization, you can do that using the Python API. Then you can do a comprehensive search. Even, the, even though you don't know the passwords of your users, you being an administrator have access to the content those people have, whether it's shared publicly or it's a private item. So you can use the Python API to go look at, do a comprehensive search of all the items that are in your enterprise or organization and find where, who, what they are. And if a particular item is missing, then you can ask the publishers to go and publish the new item. You can determine the relationship between items. It's a little bit of an advanced topic, but it is useful when you're trying to clone an item from one location to another. You'll have to, it's kind of a chain that is linking items behind the scenes. And administrators can use the Python API to find what they are and establish the chain that, that links if they are broken. And you can create reports. Like you can find out which user uses a GIS at the maximum, who uses, publishes a lot of content, who's using a lot of credits, who's not using more credits, who's using a lot of pro licenses, who's running out of, who has checked out all the licenses. All these kind of things you can find entitlements, you can assign it to users. You can find out the servers that are behind the scenes, which server is running a lot. You can do uh, reports of your service, servers, and such kind of things. Then in the middle, we have RGS uh, content publishers. These people can automate a lot of the data creation process. They can find out, based on the reports that administrators can provide, they can look at the times that are not the peak usage time, and they can schedule their um, tile update process or feature update process during that time. So your servicers, your servers are not maxed out. They can keep running in a smooth manner. And the next day when your consumers or analysts come back, they have updated layers to make use of. Then you can replicate development environment from, uh, in, in terms of content from one location to another. And uh, if, if, if a user comes back and says that my web app, which is using a web map, is broken, it no longer draws, you can go and inspect what layers are participating in that web map, and you can find out why it is broken. And if it is broken, you can go and republish that service. Or you can write a query that goes and looks at all your web maps and web scenes and finds out those web maps which are actually broken and which no longer work. You can go and fix them up or make a report out of them. Then on the other end, you have analysts and data scientists. These people mine the rich data that you have in RGIS and the numerous powerful analytical tools, and they can bring out the patterns in that data. They can make use of the Python API because it plugs in really well with not, not only the rich analytical tools of RGIS, but you can also use a lot of third-party and open source plotting and data analysis, visualization libraries, machine learning libraries in Python. And you can take data from your RGIS, plug and play with it, with these open source libraries, do the analysis, get the result, bring it back to RGIS for persisting and sharing it back to your users. And throughout the science and academic field, Scientists, students, everybody love the Jupyter Notebooks. It's extremely popular because there are so many different science packages that plugs really well. And as part of our offering, the Python API has rich visualization. You saw the map widget that plugs in and brings a new map. If you have items, groups, content, you can visualize that as nice HTML with thumbnails, etc., cetera, um, in Jupyter Notebooks. So all, in, in terms of reproducible research, all that the scientist has to do is just share that notebook to somebody else. That person gets it, they have uh, verbatim, they have multimedia, multi, um, uh, they have text, images, equations, everything in the Jupyter Notebook. They have code in terms of Python, you have web layers that point out the data that's used for these analysis tools. Then you have the rich, um, uh, the, the, the feature anal analysis tools or big data tools as part of the Python code. And if the person has to reproduce the research, all that they have to do is just run the notebook and they get the output back. So let's start with the first demo. We want to look at 
um, how an administrator can make use of the Python API. This entire session is going to be fairly basic and very introductory. We have some more sessions throughout the user conference where we go a little bit detail into one of these sessions individually. So the first step, I'm going and importing the Python library. I'm making a connection to my, um, to my RGS enterprise. And here, I want to search for my users. And the way I do it, I just query gis.users.search. And if you see, I can pull up the IntelliSense that hit, hit a tab after the dot, and I can see what all properties are exposed of my GIS object. So I can do, you can use content to look for content, you can use groups to look for groups. Similarly, I can use users to get the users, the properties to pull up the properties for my GIS. Then I can, right now I'm using uh, users.search, so I can do users dot, and once again, if I do, I get the methods that are exposed of the users. I can do search, if we want to know a syntax, I can just do shift tab, and in the Jupyter Notebook, I get to see the method parameters. I can specify a query, I can do all that such kind of things. If we want to get into a little bit detail, I can hit the plus sign. If we want to really read some more of it, I can hit the, huh, okay, I can do something like this. I can do a question mark, and it brings up the rich uh, help document for that. And you can get it for pretty much anything in the Python API. And you also get it for any open source third party library that is built in a proper um, API build style. Okay, now with that, we got the list of all the users that are in our RGS enterprise. I can specify a query. I can find out a user with the name Williams. And I get back this. I can do something like this. I can do wildcard search, wildcard search. I can say, will star, and I'm expecting to see these two users show up. To run it, I get something like this. I can, I, can, I can make it even more complicated. I can say, give me all the users that are administrators only. Give me all the users that are of role, a particular custom role that you create. By the way, you can create custom roles using Python API. There's a guide document that talks about that. Now, I want to see if Rohit is part of this or not. Rohit is not. So let's see how we can add Rohit as a user uh, to our organization. And how I do that? Using the same procedure. GIS.users, instead of search, I'm calling create, and I'm passing, giving my username, a password that he can never really remember. Give him my username, first name, last name, an email address, and a role for him. This is one of the built-in roles, but if you have a custom role that you define, you can give a name for that role and creates a user based on that. Let's go ahead and run it. And just like that, you created a new user in your GIS organization. If I query the type, so I'm capturing the output of this method in a variable called Rohit, and I'm just pulling up the type of that variable. It happens to be an RGS.GIS user. Now, in my disk, in this current folder, I have a thumbnail image for Rohit, so I can just call update method, pass in the thumbnail, and I can update the user. <laughs> You can also pass some other parameters. Like for instance, you can change the role of that user. You can use, you can, there's a preferred view, you can set the description, tags, um, region, and so many other things that your GIS supports, you can pass them and update the user. Now we saw that, now let's shift gears and see how you can search for groups in your GIS. So do you see this pattern that we are following? You did gis.users.search and create. Now for groups, you can do gis.groups.search.create. You know, this kind of intuitive pattern is what you can see throughout the Python API. So if you learn some pieces of the API, you can predict how, it'll go, how it's going to behave in some other parts. This way you don't really have to keep a lot of things in your mind. It, you know, it has to feel intuitive when you start using that. So now, just like that, we search for the groups in our GIS. Now, I know that Rohit is interested in crime analysis, crime prediction, and how we can use machine learning for solving crime and finding patterns. So let's create a group called crime analysis. There's already a group called crime analysis one, so let's make, make it crime analysis. And we are giving it a title, we're giving it a name, um, a summary, a description, and we're also giving a thumbnail. So all of this together, we're going to create a new group, capture it in a variable called crime group, and let's pull that up. 
we just created a crime group. So it's a fully furnished group. You have thumbnail, you have description, everything over there. And if you want to add a user to the group, just call that group object dot add users. And I'm specifying the user that we just created. Let's go ahead and add him. So this is just a Python API of saying that it, it did not add, okay. I think I made a mistake. What I need to do here is not a user object. Instead, specify the username. Okay, that didn't work. Rohit dot sign. Okay, let's see if we actually added Rohit or not. Okay, so I'm going to figure out why this failed. I'll get back to you on that. So um, let's look at the, uh, some other thing that we can do with the GIS. Now we want to find, uh, there is a user Batman in our GIS, just over here, this guy. Now we don't like this guy in our GIS. It's not performing well. So we want to kick him out. So let's see how we can do that. So let's go and search for Batman. There he is. <laughs> now what we want to do, so let's take this out for a bit. So we want to call delete on that guy. Uh-oh, a GIS comes back and says, it's not so easy to delete Batman after all. This guy cannot be deleted because he already owns some groups or items. So this is your GIS way of protecting, deleting some content inadvertently when you can delete a user. So you have to make a decision on what you want to do with that user's content. You can opt to delete all of that content, or you can reassign that content to some other existing user you already have. So that's what we are trying to do here. So when you're calling delete function, let's, it, it accepts a parameter, reassign to. It's called reassign to, and let's reassign all the content of Batman to Rohit Singh. That's it. Now, if you come back to Rohit's content, everything that you reassign from a user to another user goes into a folder and the folder has a syntax something like the user name underscore root. Everything that's in the root of that user goes there. If there's a folder for that user, it creates that username underscore folder name and puts all the content over there. Now I can query Rohit's items and specify that folder. I can look at all, at all uh, items he has. And if I'm interested in finding out the folders, all the folders that belongs to a particular user, I can call username.folders and I get the list of all folders. So there was a very brief demo that shows how RGS administrators can make use of the Python API. And once you have something scripted like this, maybe every time a new user, a existing user leaves your organization, you make a decision and how you want to reassign that content. Maybe you get the content all into your account, or you find out some other user that's already part of their organization, the group, and you assign it to that group's moderator or group's owner. You can make a decision like that. You can write a script or a Jupyter notebook. Something like that happens in the future. You don't have to multitask and you, know, you don't have to jump into this and take care of that. All that you have to do is just go ahead and run it. Or maybe you can even automate that even to a further extent. Maybe um, plug it all in into an uh, automation server like Jenkins and say whenever there's a user that removes from your Active Directory, go ahead and run this Python script. So it takes care of cleaning up your RGS enterprise. You can do things like that as being an administrator. Now let's change gears and let's look at what we have next. We're going to see how content publishers can make use of the Python API. And so for this, let's take a look at this scenario. You know, California has really fierce summers and every summer we have the problem of forest fires. So what we want to do, uh, being a publisher, is we want to run a spatial analysis and we want to find out what all assets that belong to a particular company fall within a risk area um, around an active fire. So we don't want to do that manually. We have been doing that manually a lot of times now. 
Um, but what we want to do is to write that as a process in Python in a Jupyter notebook. And we want to do spatial overlay analysis to find out those facilities that are at risk. Once we find that, we want to, there's an existing web map that contains all the facilities that are at risk, which the firefighters and emergency management personnel always look at. So we want to, at the end, we want the script to update that web map with this newly created web layer that contains up-to-date information on which facilities are at risk. And along this process, let's also make a CSV of all the, pro all the properties and addresses of the property, and we can shoot an email to somebody else who are not really part of the GIS, but just take a look at the uh, email. <laughs> so let's see how we can do that using the Python API. So the first step, let's connect to our GIS. Then, let's search for a group. Los Angeles County Emergency Management. Let's find the list of items in the group. See, building on the previous demo, we create, we have a group object. We are calling the content method. We're getting all the items that belong to the group. And we are looping through each of that, and we are printing out. So this is the web map that we are interested in. And here is a layer that says all the infrastructure that's in Southern California area. And here is another feature layer that gives you the active fire boundaries. Maybe a scientist created this active layer. Maybe it's a modus image that they are interpreting and finding out the fire periphery. Or it could be um, a layer from a company like Firewatt or something like that where they sell information on active fires. Now let's pull up a map and visualize that. We are specifying the extent for Los Angeles. This is the zoom level. Let's add the forest fires. The, that's the layer we can see in blue on the screen. Now let's go ahead and add our infrastructures, the point data sets. Now we can see there are some points which are close to this fire, over here too, here as well. Maybe here is another fire going on. We don't know how many fires are there right now. Now let's get the web map item while we are at it. So we are storing the web map into this variable called web map item. Now what we want to do is now we have all the layers that we need for our analysis. Let's go ahead and create a, a buffer. We decide the distance what the buffer has to be based on our risk tolerance or how fast emergency management can get to the properties. Let's create another map. Let's add the fires. Once again, add the uh, infrastructures. Now, to build the buffers, we are using, um, we are importing the features module, use proximity toolset. We are calling the create features um, method. And when we are creating a buffer, I mean, create buffers method, and we are calling it here, specifying the input as the fires as a polygon layer. This is the, uh, the distance for which we want to create the, uh, the buffers. We are specifying the unit here and an output. In case of an output, because we want to persist this every time we run it, we want to, at the later stage, we want to probably automate this, we are giving it a timestamp as a suffix to the layer name. So let's go ahead and run this. And it's going to take a while to run this. The, the important point here, another one that we want to make here, is this buffer operation is not running on my local laptop. It's not running on my Mac. Instead, it's actually running on the server behind the scenes that's powering, that powering the web GIS. Okay. Let's see. Let's try this one more time. What's the error? No particular message has failed. This is surprising. I just ran it while. <laughs> Let's figure this one out too. Okay. Let's go and find the fire buffers that I just created before this uh, talk. So it's supposed to begin with the name fire underscore buffers underscore. Let's find out. And it's a feature layer. OK, so there are some outputs. Let's find the one that's closest. Today is 7-Eleven, right? So this is the one. So let's make the fire buffers point to this layer. 
store the output into a variable search result and uh, let's print this one out too and let's get this as minus 2 okay so we just made use of a previously run search result um, fire buffer operation let's go ahead with this let's um, share this layer to everyone because we want to create the web map that is publicly shared to everyone and all the layers of the web map also has to be shared with everyone with the same level of privacy if you want the end users to be able to view the layers in the web map now let's add the fire buffers back to our web map back to our map widget and even though this is a previous result we can see this is our active fire boundary and then we have buffers of four miles around each of this next operation in our analysis is to find all those all those facilities that are falling within this boundary and we want to use the overlay operation for doing that similarly we are using from managed data uh, Submodule. we are importing the overlay layers and we are specifying inputs as the fire buffers, infrastructures, and overlay as intersects. So we only pick out those, prop those facilities that fall within the, within the buffer. And we are going to give it an output name as well. Okay, keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> That passed. Okay, now let's share this one also to everyone, just following the same paradigm of privacy. Now let's take a look at the layers we have in this overlay result. We have one feature layer. Now this is the important layer. This is the final result of our analysis. Let's go and take a look a little bit deeper into this. What we're trying to do here is to get the, the feature layer from this new item that we created, the overlay result, and we're running a query and we are visualizing, when we run the query to get all the features, we are representing that as a pandas data frame. And this is one of the nice features about the Python API, is using the map widget, you could see in geographic space where all the features are there. Now, using the pandas data frame, when you query a feature layer, you can visualize in a table space how the features are and various attributes for those features. You can see there are a number of different columns but for us, only a few are important to us. So let's filter that out and have a simplified representation of the feature table. Now we have the various properties that are at risk, the name of them, um, a category ID, and a post ID. And what we could do is go ahead and write this to a CSV file. Just like that, we created a CSV file to disk, and we can go and share that email uh, in an email attachment we can send, and we can say these are the risk facilities that are at risk, so you can take care of that. Now, to begin with, we had three items in our group. One was infrastructures, the other one was active fires, the other one was a web map. So we are making use of the web map here. And finally, what we want to do is to update the web map with the new infrastructures that are at risk, replace the old URL with a new URL for the new analysis result we have. Before that, let's look at those infrastructure that are at risk on a map. Yeah, so the orange polygons, orange points, represent the, all the infrastructures, and the ones in blue are the ones that are currently at risk that we got out of our analysis. And then what we could do is to get the web map item, read it as a web map object using the mapping module, web map class. And what I'm doing is looping through each of that and printing out the old stale um, analysis result. Now what I want to do is to replace with a new URL, and then to update the web map, all that I have to do is web map object dot update, and the web map is updated now. Now anyone that uses this web map, maybe in their collector, or RGS for Explorer, RGS for Navigator apps, they don't have to look at a new web map now. They always can have just the same web map, and every time you run this process behind the scenes, the web map gets up to date. That way they can just have a few web maps that they're working with, but it is always up to date with your information. 
This could be any process behind the scenes. This is one example. And you could time and schedule when this kind of script gets run. That way you can keep your data layers up to date. Okay. <laughs> you want to go through the I'll do the analysis. You do yeah. that? Yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry. Okay, so let's switch over. Okay, we've switched over. And I want to show one more analysis, and this is using imagery layers. And uh, Raster analysis is as easy in, in our GIS as, as vector analysis is. So here I'm searching my GIS for this Landsat layer. This, this Landsat layer contains multiple, uh, you know, it's, it's multi-spectral, so contains many bands of information. So uh, that's the first item. I got it in this Landsat item. And I'm getting the layer from that item that's through the layers property, like we saw for feature layer collections, a feature layer collection contains layers. Similarly, a Landsat imagery layer item has layers. And uh, we've seen how you can query an, an imagery layer. It shows a raster representation within the notebook. I could set an extent, it'll show me that extent. So let's uh, create, uh, geocode a new location and add this layer on that location. And we are looking at this, this location where there have been some fires recently. It's in Montana. And imagery layers are, can be published with um, different kinds of raster functions. That these raster functions do dynamic image processing. Like on the fly, it's doing image processing at the display resolution and applying a particular band combination. So we can see the same imagery layer in, in many different visualizations like agriculture or bathymetric, you know, color infrared and so on. So I was just cycling through the different raster functions this layer has been published with and displaying them here. Now, let me show you how we can do raster processing by ourselves. We provide you with over 100 functions in the ArcGIS raster functions module. And they, they include things like stretch and extract band, NDVI, uh, SAVI, uh, convolutional operators, things like that. So here I'm doing something very simple. I'll, uh, this, I've created my own function that will chain two raster functions. So first, it's going to extract the given bands from my input layer. Then it's going to do a percent clip, person stretch, and uh, enhance the image. So I've defined this function here, and I'm creating that a map again. And this time, when I'm adding the layer, I have said that it should uh, apply that function. So I, I can just chain functions as, as, as I would normally do in Python and call them. So although this doesn't look you know, anything exciting, but Really, this is doing it on the web GIS. And uh, if you were to do it before the Python API came, then you would have dealt with like a JSON representation of these functions. And it would be a lot of verbose code to do something similar. So what I did was I extracted the, the four, five, three band combination. And this visualization makes it easy to see where land is and where water is. So all the lakes start showing up in black color. And this is still dynamic image processing. It's only doing it for the pixels on screen and uh, on the fly. It's not doing it across the whole raster. And this is where the image server comes in, where uh, we can do raster anal analytics. So I'm connecting to my portal here, uh, ArcGIS Enterprise, which has this imagery layer showing the burned areas from the fires. I get that in this variable here. And once again, I've processed, done the same processing, called the process uh, bands function, but with a different band combination. I've done it for the 752 band combination that makes it easy to visualize where the burn scars from a forest fire are. So we see that uh, I could visualize the results in, in, in the notebook, but this is again just doing it uh, at display resolution. I can't use it for analysis. Now, if I want to do this processing across the extent of my 
whole imagery layer and at source resolution I can just call the save method on it and that save method is going to do uh, uh, it's going to generate a new raster it's going to call into the distributed servers in my image server and uh, notice that I just ran it uh, while Atma was giving his talk, I didn't want to waste your time to have it go, you know, run through it. And I've told it to do a verbose output, so you see all of this output. And once I've done that, it's now become a new imagery layer in my ArcGIS Enterprise, and here I'm visualizing it, and I, I don't need to do any further processing, I can uh, simply visualize it, and I see that the burn scars and the forest fires are visualized here. So I think we covered uh, different kind of uh, scenarios, personas, what they could do with it. Next, uh, I want to show you uh, how you can experience it, like how do you get these notebooks in the first place. And the simplest way to do that is to go to notebooks.sre.com and our guide, our samples, they are all there as, you know, in, in, a, in a hosted environment and you could just run it without installing it. So here uh, you can go to the samples, visualize them. Uh, so let's look at this one. This is a fun sample tour the world with Landsat imagery. So you can just uh, open a sample, start clicking run. So this is the run cell met, you know, button that I'm clicking and it's doing it on the fly on, on that hosted environment. Now it's going to visualize some areas with different uh, raster functions applied to them. So I just created a map, now let's la add a layer to it. So this one is a image that we had put in uh, to mock this up, but this should apply there. So we see uh, an area was visualized with this raster function. It's, it's also extracting a particular band combination and stretching it. This one is interesting. It's showing uh, an interesting structure in central Mauritiana in, in the Sahara Desert. And uh, let's visualize it. Once again, let's get rid of the static image, do it on the fly. And with the 631 uh, band combination, it gives a very interesting uh, visualization. It's called the Eye of the Sahara. So you, you got an idea of what, you know, how you can use these, uh, run the samples from notebooks.se.com. That's like your playground where you could just try it out without installing anything. That's the easiest way to get started with it. You could also create a new notebook. So file, new, Python 3 notebook. And you can start writing your code. And once you, you're done, with your work, you would need to save it because this is a temporary environment. So the way you would do it is you could say file download as and then you, you download your notebook. And once that will let you download it on your disk and the next time you want to continue working it, you can then you know uh, upload your notebook. It, there's an option for that. Open. Do you remember how we can upload? There's an option for uploading your own, own notebooks. Oh yeah, here it is. Yeah. So on the tree view, you can upload your own notebooks, what you were working with, and work with those in, in that environment. So that's the easiest way to get started, but I'm hoping that we've convinced you more that it's not, you won't just go to notebooks.st.com, you want to install it. That's how, uh, let's see how you do that. We've got a very simple install from current slide, sorry, did it from the beginning. So that tells you that I'm not a slideshow person. <laughs> I'm a developer. Okay, so uh, it's, you know, uh, you get Conda and uh, you can install this API. It's a simple command, Conda install minus C gives the channel that's the S3 channel, you'll get it from there. How do you get Conda? There are two ways to get Conda. If you already have ArcGIS Pro installed, Pro comes with its own version of Conda called Mini Conda. 
and it even has a better, uh, you know, you don't even need to go to the command line to install it. But if you were to do it, let's say on a Mac, or you don't have Pro installed, this API is cross-platform. It works on, on Linux, uh, Mac, Windows, everywhere Python runs. So this is a, like a quick uh, demo of, you know, where I've sped through the installation of Conda. So you search for Anaconda for Python, that's provided by Continuum Analytics, and this package, the Anaconda package, comes with, uh, it's a big install, but it comes with so many Python libraries like Pandas, NumPy, Matplotlib, that it's, uh, it's, it gives you like a whole lab to work with. And it also, the, the, the benefit of Conda is that it lets you create multiple environments. So you could create one environment with you know, certain libraries, another environment with other libraries, and they won't conflict with each other. It's a environment manager. So I download Anaconda, and I just go through the you know, next, next, next workflow, install it. And while I was uh, you know, downloading it, I think it prompts you for getting a cheat sheet. I do recommend you get that cheat sheet. It's a one or two page PDF with the most common commands of using Conda, it's very useful. So this is just a workflow that I've sped through. You, you install it. Once you've installed Anaconda, you'll go to your start menu, you'll find it there. And, uh, and then you, uh, in there you'll find a, um, the Anaconda command prompt. So here I'm going to my start menu, going to Anaconda folder that I just installed, and I'll, I'll get the Anaconda prompt. And in there, you give that command, conda install minus C, S3, ArcGIS, and it'll install the API, it'll install Jupyter Notebook, and it'll configure the widgets, it'll do everything. And from that point on, you could then do the step I did, which was to start Jupyter Notebook in the beginning of, of this presentation. So, yeah, that, that I think, uh, is, is just that same workflow. We don't need to go through the whole workflow. We've seen that. And this is showing like how you would um, do it in, in ArcGIS Pro. You go to the Python backstage by clicking this button on the top left. And in there, if you go to Python, you can just search for packages to install. And you just search for ArcGIS, and it lets you add packages. So here I've already installed the ArcGIS package, so it shows up. It's, it's a very simple install that uh, you, know, you could do, and, and the guide goes through it. I think we'll quickly switch over to Atma, and he'll tell us about the resources that are available for you to learn more about this API. So this is the uh, product page for RGS API for Python. It's on developers.rgs.com forward slash Python. And every talk that we give, all these presentation resources, everything is going to be linked up from this site. So if you want one particular site to remember for the Python API, this would be that page. You can make a note of this one. So if you look at it, there are sections like guide. So if I look at guide, it gives you a kind of a top-down approach of the various modules that are in the Python API, and it kind of instructs you how to make use of that, best practices for using it, and so on. It even gives you um, elaborate instructions for how to set up the various ways in which you can use it, and how you can install it using Pro. Um, one of you want to take a screenshot or photo of this one, if you wanted to. So uh, this screenshot is, has to be updated. The important thing is that when you go and search right now, the version number here shows 1.0, it would be updated to 1.2. And for folks that already have the Python API, make sure that you click on Update Packages, and you update the Python API from 1.0 or 1.0.1 from 2.1.2. I'm going to go back to the top. And then it goes on to talk about the different GIS, different modules, like the GIS module, what all you can do. For instance, we looked at um, accessing and managing users. We looked at how to create users today, how to search for users, 
It goes in detail and talks about the roles and other things that we didn't talk about today. Similarly, for feature data and analysis, it shows you how you can make use of the different, uh, how you can read feature data into the Python API, how you can apply analyses. And similarly, for raster data sets, um, how to work with big data tools in your RGS enterprise, using GP tools, um, geocoding and finding places, batch geocoding, reverse geocoding, et cetera, making use of network analyses and all that. Then here we have some sample notebooks. These are more application driven. So uh, they take a particular use case and they can they try to explain how you can use a Python API to solve that use case. So for instance, if you look at power users and developers, you have the tour of the world with Landsat imagery that Rohit showed a little bit earlier. Then you have some more uh, sample notebooks, how we can build dashboard style applications using Python API. Then org administrators, we saw something like uh, cloning your portal from one portal to another portal, how you can clone users groups content, or how you can clone just a group. And an interesting thing here is for all of these samples, you have these buttons on the top. If you click on download the samples, it takes you to this page, and you click on clone, the, you can get it as an archive, which will just download as a zip file. Or if you're using GitHub for your projects, you can click on this. It takes you through to our GitHub repository, where you can go ahead and clone it on your computer, or you can fork it and start working on it on, on the side. So I'm going to go back. Most of these samples we have also come with some kind of data. So you can, uh, here there are some samples that show how we can use big data analysis tools. And we have here something that shows um, how to use weighted overlay analysis, raster analysis using the Python API. At the same time, you can download the samples. You can click on try it, try it live. It takes you directly to a live version of that sample that runs on <laughs> notebooks.sd.com. Yeah, it takes you and to And we just released it like uh, last week, so. Is it for everything okay. or just a particular? I think it's the traffic that's hitting it right now. <laughs> so I think a lot of people are starting to use in live notebooks. It has a it does a count. It cannot go more than a, a specific number. So we we're trying to analyze, find out how many users are using it on a long term basis and how many how much servers we need to stand oh, up for. Oh yeah, I mean the the notebook I just showed you that's also not showing up now. Yeah, and um, the other thing is the API reference. So here we have guide which gives you elaborate information about the API, sample notebooks that are application driven, and how you can use various modules to make to solve a particular application you have at hand. And then when you are coding and writing your own, writing your scripts, you also want to look up some of those particular classes and methods. So the API reference that's where it comes in. You can use a search bar. You can search for what you want, or you can look at one of these. Um, <coughs> One of these modules here, for instance, Network Module, you can click on that, and you can look at the various classes we have, various methods, and you can find an explanation for how to use each of that. Let's go back here. And the last thing we have is a GeoNet forum. A lot of our users are already members of this one. Is, is anyone here already part of the um, Python API GeoNet? Okay, that's a good opportunity. So you can all go sign up and become members of GeoNet. Um, we have a pretty active community where a lot of people come and ask questions, answer others' questions, and discuss how they can use Python API. They saw, uh, report bugs back to us. They have they ask for announcements, features that they want in the API. And we're also pretty active. We try to um, go there and keep uh, uh, stay engaged. We also write blog posts. Um, we have a, a blog post going on where we post all the videos related to Python API. Whoever gives a talk, they gives us the video, and then we post it up there. So there's a place where you can frequent and take a look at um, if you want to share it to someone else that wants to learn the API, you can point them to this blog post. Um, that concludes. Yeah, so let's switch over. One second. So, uh, yeah, I think that concludes our session. Please do fill out the survey. Uh, that's very valuable for us. Uh, it motivates us if you give good food. Feedback, and if you, if you give poor feedback, that also motivates us in different ways. But what really helps us is that there's a free form in, in there where you can give your suggestions or what you liked, what you didn't like. We read every one of them, and uh, that's, that's very good for us. And we've got uh, a number of sessions lined up for you. Uh, if, whether you're an analyst or developer, 
or a data, you know data scientist or a Ad administrator, I, I think in every slot we've got a Python API session for you. You'll find something interesting for, for your uh, interests. And I think that concludes our uh, session. We are open for questions. Uh, thank you. This will be recorded, yes? Yeah. Uh, you had a question? Yeah. Um, thanks. So that was fantastic. Yeah, Thank you. Really you. Did you just clarify how, when you're in Jupyter Notebooks, you're signing into your Enterprise or your RJS online account, uh, like with your password, for example, and then maybe suggest good practice for if you're sharing your notebooks, how other users can access the content with obviously our giving, without giving away your login uh, details? Yes. So. There are a few ways to do that. One way is just to leave out just the password. For example, uh, you're seeing my screen, right? So I could do it like this if I, uh, you know, if I do it like this, then I could run my notebook, enter my password, and I'll be able to log in. So that's, I think I got an error because Del dev maps. But yeah, I mean, that's the idea that you just leave out the password and it'll prompt you for the password. .rgs.com. Oh, yeah, that should be rgs.com. So that way you, you could run your code and uh, others won't see your password. You could still have it. Another way is that you can, um, this constructor lets you. So yeah, other, other ways that if, if your organization already uses integrated Windows authentication or LDAP, then you don't need to put it that in. You just give in just the URL and it'll figure out that your organization is using uh, integrated Windows authentication and it'll sign you in with that authentication. The third way is that uh, you, you can create profiles. So that's a new option that we've added. Uh, let me show that to you. Let me create a new notebook. I'm not getting the IntelliSense. But uh, if you look at the, so one of the options is profile. So the first time you log in, you can see your URL, your username and password, and also give it a profile name, my org. And the next time on, what that does is it saves uh, your password on your computer in your home directory in a file that's only readable by you in a uh, obfuscated format, not encrypted. But um, so from that point on, you can log in just by giving that profile name. So it'll work for your computer uh, but anybody else you share out the notebook to, they won't see your username and password, and they'll know, you know how to log on to with their account. Yes. You have a question there. Uh, so at the beginning of your session, you said that the default sign-in location is RPS Online. Yes. But a lot of the, uh, the analyses that you presented today are anything like image server, et cetera. So how much of the analyses that you gave today actually require So the what analysis are available for an anonymous user? Is that your question? I think so. Yeah, ArcGIS Online. Uh, you can do certain analysis with public services. So all the Im uh, the raster functions with public image services, you can do that for visualization. If you were to create a new image product, you need Im uh, image server. Uh, if you want to do spatial analysis, then you need a named user license for ArcGIS Online. So like the hotspots, yeah. yeah, yeah, for hotspots, uh, routing, you do yeah. need an, you know a license. We do give out 60-day licenses for free for trial if you want to. You know those are available if you're just getting started. Mm -hmm. And um, if you want to do big data, then you need a GeoAnalytics server. Now, there are other people who share out their services. They might share out their geoprocessing tools. 
you can consume those through this API without a named user license because they are sharing out there. I mean, you're, you're just calling into it. That you yeah. could do. So the compute happens on their server, yeah. not on your account, so you're not charged for any credits. Yeah. And, and then is. certain things like single line geocoding, anonymous users could do that. There's no restriction on so that. My organization does have an image server, so we would be able to do that processing using these Jupyter notebooks on our server and then publish it to our ArcGIS online account. Is that you, can, you cannot publish an image service yet to an ArcGIS online. What you could rather do is publish that as a tile layer for visualization. Okay. Yeah, so you could do something like that. Say that again, please. Calling the publisher rights. Publisher rights. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, back there. Uh, um, so if you were to do a spatial analysis, uh, does the API provide where you, you can preview the amount of credits prior to running that analysis? No. Uh, currently, that functionality is not there. Thanks for the feedback, though. Uh, yeah. There was another question. Yeah. Uh, for the most part, practically, it wouldn't matter if it's fairly recent. The Under the hood, this API uses uh, Portal Pi and ArcRes, which have worked with older versions of your GIS. So the practical uh, answer is that it may not matter, but you wouldn't get support for versions prior to 10.5. Yes, so if it's in-house, you could use this API in-house in your LAN to connect to it. It would work. Yes? Do you have to have a portal, or can you connect directly to your LAN? You don't have to have a portal. It works with servers, standalone servers as well. So if you've got a service, like a feature service or an image service, you've got a URL, you can create uh, objects for those services, and you can call methods supported by feature services and image services. We have also added, uh, in this release, we've added a server administration API. You can administer standalone servers and connect them to your portal. So we do encourage that you have a portal that uh, gives you a lot more capabilities. You get all that rich experience of, you know, the the users, groups, content management that you don't get with standalone servers. But it does work with uh, service URLs. So the question is that as part of your workflow, uh, you got certain images in your notebook. How do you save them and share them with others in individually? Yes, I think uh, you can, well, for one, uh, in many cases you'd find that the images get uh, encoded and saved as part of the notebook itself. So. Uh, it's not saved out as an external file, but it's, I think it's a base64 encoding that's within the notebook itself. That's one way to do it. Another way is that you could right click on those images and, and uh, you know save it out as, as an image if, if it's just an image. You could do that. That's just standard you know, web page image thing. You call the export method, export, export method. Export method on. Oh, are you talking about imagery layers, or are you talking about pictures and embedded in your HTML? Okay, so, right, so to clarify, if you create a map widget, that cannot currently be persisted outside the lifespan of the notebook. So all the steps to get to that widget, to that state, state will be persisted in your notebook, and if you share that notebook with others, they could rerun those steps and arrive at the same map. But it, you don't have the ability to save this out as a web map. We do have APIs to create web maps and save them. We do have samples for that as well. But that's an upcoming capability uh, that we are working on. 
Then once you've composed the web map, added some layers, maybe drawn something on the map, you save it out as a web map. That's something that's coming up. So the question is, can you run custom geoprocessing tools, uh, services from the API? Yes, you can, and we have a sample for that. This is in the power user and developer section. It uses a custom geoprocessing service that's, that's been, uh, this is the one, uh, sorry. Yeah, this is the one, the ocean currents tool, message in a bottle. This is an example of that. <laughs> Okay, so every sample code. Yeah, let's say let's say try live doesn't work because we are having teething troubles. I guess. Let's give it a moment, but okay, it did it did work in this case, but let's say that it didn't work. You know, or what what is the other way to do it? You can click the download the samples button and uh, download all of the samples as a zip file, or you can go to our GitHub repository, you can clone it. So that, we've got a button for that as well, you know, cloning, uh, sorry, going to the GitHub repository. So all the samples in are in the GitHub? Yes, all the samples are available through GitHub. Okay. And, So the question is, can you do administrative tasks like stopping and starting services on an ArcGIS server? And the answer is yes. We just released uh, a new update to this API last week that has a server administration module. That's a sub-module of your GIS module. Yeah, there's a session on that. Uh, you you want to show that slide? Yes. Uh, where are those? So they, they, we've got a session for that as well. That's administration yeah that one uh, right above your mouse automating our G enterprise gis administration using python yeah. that's the one you should go to any other questions yes we import gis from either your local uh, on prem server or from online you don't have to have any Trying to figure out how that library fits down to the client. Oh, okay. So the library is um, is always on the client. It just talks to the server. Okay. So, the, so when I when I initiate a geoprocessing task, do I have to have that geoprocessing task, either the out of the box geoprocessing task or something else running on so, the server? So the question is that if you were to uh, call a geoprocessing task, does it need to be running on your desktop or did no, on, the on the server? So yes, if you if you want to call a geoprocessing task, you would need it running on a server, and and the API sits on your computer and talks to the server through the REST protocol, gets the job done. Yes, yes, there's a question here. Data yes. Uh, you want to talk about, so the question is how do you uh, keep a feature service uh, refreshed or with live data, you know, as your data changes? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you could use, uh, you could do it two ways. One is if depending on the number of features you're updating, you can find out which features have to be updated. And you can, if you want to just blow away the service and republish that, you can use the overwrite. Um, functionality in this, API. in this API. In fact, there is a session that I'm going to be mostly focusing about that, and there are a couple of samples. If you look at the sample notebooks under this uh, publisher section, um, at the very fair end of that uh, bucket, you would have... Overwriting features, services, and updating features in feature layers, layers. these two. Yeah, and it, 
If you take the updating features in a feature layer, it takes you through a course on pandas, how you can use that to find out which features got up to date. Say you have a local data set, you have a data set that's on your GIS, you can find out what features got up, were updated, and you can decide to update them. Um, it should be the uh, GS. Oh, let me bring that up. Uh, yeah. Clone. Admin, administrators and publishers, demo theater. This one, yeah. Thursday, Thursday, 1220. Yeah. Demo theater, 8. Yeah, you can bring your lunch. Very nice. Sure. Yes, there's a question there. Yes, so the question is, can we show you a way to connect with an ArcGIS server which is federated with portal for ArcGIS? So um, we've got uh, on the server object, we've got a method called uh, admin. So you need to be an administrator to go get to the servers from there. Just type that in. Sure. Amazing underscore RGS underscore. Type that in. Oh, okay. Uh, don't don't hit enter yet. That should be portal here, right? Correct. So that's a portal that we have, and we're trying to connect to it. And you'd find, if it works, that I could go to admin.servers and then do a list, and that'll give me all the servers in there. Like, that's the way to do it if whenever it comes back. Okay, then I do not need to send any tokens, right? You don't need to send any tokens. It figures out the tokens by itself. And there's a help for this on the Atma, did we put the, put in the help for the server administration? No, not yet. That's coming up. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I would recommend this will be shown in this session here, the one for automating enterprise GIS administration using Python, right. Tuesday, 4:30. This particular thing will be demoed, and the developers will be, you know, those who developed this will will show this to you. You're welcome. Are you guys available downstairs to uh, talk to it all, or do you have downstairs? There are a couple guys, uh, a few guys downstairs uh, in the server GIS island. And Atma and I are mostly busy in sessions, but whenever we find time in between, we'll be down there as well. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you.